Okay, so um, I'm very happy to uh, have uh, this morning um, today to give the Keys Virtual Seminar. Lee, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Um, oops, that is my fault. That is YouTube. Okay. Um, so the the title of the talk today is The Universe as a Collection of Partial Use of Itself. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. And Lee, it's all yours. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for coming and listening. Um, I know that the premise of your seminar is what quantum information and quantum gravity can do for each other. And my point of view is a little bit off that, so I hope you'll forgive me. Um, I learned, and by the way, I want to mention in the many people I have to thank, Herbert Bernstein, who was my first quantum mechanics teacher, and in fact taught a course in freshman quantum mechanics, which um, blew me away and flipped me out, and I've been stuck on these questions ever since. I don't regard quantum mechanics as correct. I certainly don't regard it as complete. So my view has always been, since that freshman quantum mechanics course, that quantum mechanics needed to be completed in much the way that Einstein and Bell and many other people since have thought. And as somebody who focused on quantum gravity, and most, I, I have written a paper on something related to quantum foundation once every four or five years since over all the time. So it's been a absolutely central preoccupation of mine, but I've worked a little bit more on quantum gravity. And there also I've taken the view that quantum space time and quantum gravity is not just a technical problem to be solved by being particularly clever about techniques of quantization, but is a philosophical conceptual problem and is really one with the problem of quantum foundations. So I, I, as you'll see, I think that the two problems of quantum gravity and quantum foundations are inextricably linked and need to be solved together. And they need to be solved by something that would in the past generations been called a hidden variable theory. And I'll append to that a non-local hidden variable theory because of course we, we have theorems against local hidden variables and relational. And I'll be talking about what relational means in a little bit. And I have loads of people to thank. Some of them are there because um, without them, I would have been a really stupid scientist. And um, any privilege that I've had to have an interesting time as a scientist is due to those colleagues and friends. Um, the particular theory that I'll be introducing, which is called the causal theory of views for lack of a better name, um, is the result of the meeting of several developments, uh, approach to quantum space time called energetic causal sets that Marina Cortez and I developed over about eight years. Um, and there are the, some of the references, an approach to quantum foundations called the real ensemble approach, which I'll be discussing. Um, and sometimes it's also called the white squirrel approach. Um, and then there were influences from quantum gravity phenomenology and particularly a direction we developed with several friends called relative locality. So this is a kind of, it, it reflects all of those interests and developments. Now, if we start with thinking like a quantum field theorist, quantum gravity is for a quantum field theorist, the problem of how to do quantum field theory, which is invariant under diffeomorphisms variants and perhaps some other transformations, gauge transformations. And one of the key problems there is how do we find local observables or beables that could make sense in a diffeomorphism invariant theory. Now, um, it will become apparent, um, and many people will, will feel 
curious about how I could have such an anti devalian feeling, but I'm very much a realist. So I very much, my objection to quantum mechanics is that it doesn't give a complete description of individual events and processes. Um, I don't care whether it's deterministic or stochastic, but I want that complete description of individual processes. And I believe that why that's hard is because those processes are expressed in terms of the evolution of relationships amongst physical degrees of freedom. That is, I'm very much of a relationalist in the sort of spirit of Leibniz. And I'll be, again, making that clear. Um, so Leibniz had two great principles. Leibniz, to my reading, and what I read mostly is the monadology, um, had two great principles. One of them is the principle of sufficient reason, that there, for every distinction that might be in the universe, there must be a good reason for it. And if there's not a good reason for it, well, then it must not be a good question. So if you ask, why is the universe here and not eight meters to the left, um, the, it's hard to see giving a sensible answer to that because all the interactions we know about are about relationships and relative distances and they don't change. So it, the right answer is that there is no meaning to where the center of mass of the universe is. What matters is only relative coordinates. So that's the kind of reasoning is involved there. He also proposed the identity of the indiscernible, that if these relational or relative degrees of freedom don't distinguish two events from each other or two objects from each other, then they're actually, you're mistaken that there are two of them and there's just one. And that plays an important role at several parts of this development, particularly symmetries become incoherent. You can have gauge symmetries, but it doesn't make any sense to talk about uh, a motion that brings the universe to a state which is identical to the one that was in. Now, how do you construct observables that live up to these high ideals? And the key idea of the whole talk and of the developments I'm talking about is to steal an idea which is central to Leibniz, which is that you do it from the inside. And here Fotini Margopulo was most influential on me in her point of view of the universe from the inside. So the way I think about it is that the observables are what observers observe in the universe. That is, I'm an observer, I look around, I see the couch, there's the dot, there's the park, there's the lamp, there's the painting. And this is my neighborhood. And, and it's constructed by light signals, by photons that come to what I might think of as a little sphere around me where I'm looking through to see the past. And this I call my view of the universe. And every event has a view, which is, the, roughly speaking, whether it's discrete or continuous, the past light cone, the causal past, and it contains the information coming up to form that event from the causal past. And the view that I'll take is that we are going to construct our picture, our theory of nature from views. That is, we're not gonna talk about as if we were outside the universe, where things are. We're gonna talk about, we're not gonna have space and space will be quote emergent and will come later. We're going to talk about what are the different views of the universe. And we're going to build a dynamics which depends on nothing but distinctions between the different views. And by the principle of the identity of the indiscernible, the dynamics has to enforce that all views are distinct. And we'll see how that happens. So why am I not getting a new page? Okay, well, sorry everybody for the, techno the technological problem. Um, this talk is a little bit of an intellectual autobiography, just a slight bit, but I think it's important to understand why I've taken the commitments and the views 
that I have. And I wouldn't usually explain that in a quantum foundations or even a quantum gravity talk, because for me, the most important idea that I've, I've become convinced of and that I'm working to realize is the reality of time. And the idea that time goes all the way down and by time, I mean the processes that make continually new views, which are views of events. And related to the idea that time in that sense is fundamental is the idea that the laws evolve, that laws are not platonic absolute structures which are outside of nature and exist for some mathematical reason. I think that we've thoroughly failed at realizing that idea, but that the laws are part of nature that evolve and the time they evolve in is fundamental and more fundamental than the laws. And um, I can later come back, I have a critique of why the standard view that the, that the smaller you go in distance, the higher you go in energy, the larger symmetry you confront. And that particle physics involves a big spontaneous breaking of a big symmetry. And I think that that methodology is at a dead end and has indeed never explained anything. Um, because the, to break the symmetry, you always need more parameters than you're explaining. Um, and it just, that seems to be a dead end to me. Many people persist in doing that, but it seems to me a dead end. Um, the important lesson, um, and it's not, are you all there? It's not forwarding my page. Um, let's see. That's okay. Maybe it will work in this way. Good. Okay. Um, the so that's a dead end, and I began thinking back in the late seventies and eighties. How could we explain where the laws come from? How nature chooses its laws. And basically, I began to worry about the same thing that the anthropic principle people were starting to worry about then, which is why the law seemed to be chosen to give much more structure and complexity than would otherwise be apparent. And that also is a books and books of argument if somebody wants to argue about that. And that the only way to achieve a world that was very complex in this kind of haphazard way is if it were the result of evolution. And this Charles Sanders Peirce, the great American pragmatist philosopher was a key person in. So I took the idea from biology that laws evolve on a landscape to increase the fitness, not of a species, but of the universe and made a little toy scenario called cosmological natural selection about how the laws evolve. But, but if the laws evolve, they evolve in some time. And that means the time is more fundamental than the laws. And that means that the Wheeler DeWitt picture, that time emerges from the Wheeler DeWitt equation can't work. And the idea that the Wheeler DeWitt equation comes of course, I was very happy with the idea that the real do it equation came first and everything emerged from it. Because Ted and Carlo and I had the great pleasure of solving the real do it equation and finding an infinite number of solutions. So of course we were hooked and we loved it. But as time went on, there were real problems realizing that picture. Um, more than there was the problem I'm mentioning now. And there was also technical problems implementing that. So we, I came to the conclusion that time is fundamental. And that's the most important change of mind I've had. Um, 
From quantum gravity, there's another set of arguments which trace to another bunch of papers that space is emergent, but time can't be emergent. Time must be fundamental. And that's a lot, again, some, some other time I could trace that logic, but that's what the books are for, was to trace the logic. And finally, from quantum mechanics, I, as a realist, wanted a non-local hidden variable theory. And as I'm a relationalist, that should be a hidden variable theory whose degrees of freedom are relations between other degrees of freedom. And thinking about how to realize that dynamically leads to the view that time is fundamental. So that's why it's the confluence of those three directions that put me in the position of believing that time is fundamental. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about kinematics of this causal theory of views and then talk about dynamics and then I'll make the main claims. So I'm going a little bit faster than to leave time for discussion. So sometimes I call this theory the dynamics of difference. And it starts like all theorizing starts by asking what is real? What do we put on the table as fundamental? And I put on the table events, their causal relations, and I'm not just a pure causal set fanatic. I believe that energy and momentum are fundamental and are transferred from event to event by the causal relations. And this is the main idea that Marina Cortez and I worked on on what are called energetic causal sets. And I want to transmute that theory that we developed into a theory of views that is where the degrees of freedom are not the events and their causal relations, but the views of the events of their past as seen through the causal relation. And I can construct theories where the fundamental action is a function only of the views and contrast and differences of the views. And I'll skip, there's a relationship to topological field theory and spin foam models and Trin Simon's theory, and there's a whole lot of interesting technology there, but I'll skip that on this talk. So what is emergent in this theory? Space, there's no space fundamentally. Um, space time, quantum mechanics, because I don't, I have P's and E's, but I don't have T's and X's. So there's nothing to build a canonical commutation relation around fundamentally. How is dynamics defined? By what we call a half path integral, that is a sum over the causal processes, an integral over momentum and energy they transmit, but not the location of these processes in a background space time. What replaces locality and distance? Well, normal dynamics that we deal with in theoretical physics is based on the pre-existence of space. So we have fields that are functions of points on space. They have derivatives, we can integrate them, etc. What are we gonna replace all that technology by? And the answer is distinctions between views. So what, I believe we do have is a space of views. We know that the views have to do with the energy momentum coming from past events into the present events. And we can parameterize or describe that space of views and put a metric on it related to the metric that we could put on momentum space. So that I build in and that's it. The dynamics of the theory is a theory of views and the flow of energy and momentum. Now, what replaces kinetic energy? Because I'm gonna be very conventional 
I'm going to say a dynamics is given me by some PQ dot term, some momentum squared like term, and some potential energy. Um, and so I know what replaces locality, what replaces kinetic energy. And so I have views that are causally related, that are to the causal future of each other because I have causal relations. And basically measuring the change of views from an event to an event which immediately succeeds it causally is going to define our, our kinetic energy and what replaces potential energy is a comparison amongst all the pairs of views of how distinct they are or different they are. And that's using a function that we invented with Julian Barber a long time ago that can measure the complexity of a system of interactions like a graph or a city, if you will, in which what are the fundamental degrees of freedom are the views that each entity or event have of the rest of it. So, so that's the input in words. Um, where do we get, so I'm going to, I want to recover quantum mechanics, which means I need a probability distribution, which means I need an ensemble. And the view that I take towards the ensemble in quantum mechanics is that it's real. That is, when I say that an electron in this piece of metal right here is part of an ensemble of electrons in certain conditions, each and every one of those members of the ensemble is somewhere in the universe. So I'm going to use the function of measuring the distance between views to given one electron and its view capture throughout the universe very similar views. And that's how non-locality, of course, gets into quantum mechanics. So the quantum state represents a real ensemble of events with similar views, but spread through the universe. Since there's no space, there's nothing that permits me, that, that prohibits me from just doing that. So, and there's some technology associated with that. Again, I can describe if people want. So what are the claims? The claims are when I take a non-relativistic limit and you say, well, where did relativity come from? And it came from the geometry of momentum space. But I take a certain non-relativistic limit. I take ensembles where the number of similar events, which I call N is large. And I pull out the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation depends on the probability density of the ensemble. It depends on the phase, and the phase comes from the momentum. And again, there's a lot of detail on how, the, how you pull the phase out. Um, the potential energy is taken to be the variety of, that is, which is the sum over the distances of all a causally related pairs of the differences between them. And the kinetic energy comes from, as I was saying, the changes in the views. And that gives me the Schrodinger equation. And it also gives me controllable finite one over n corrections. And there is actually a lot of prom promise there because our friends in quantum computing laboratories can build quantum systems which have very few copies, which are, which are not in any large ensemble, and they can play with them experimentally. So I expect that these large end corrections should be genuinely testable, and it's one of the things we've been doing is studying them. So that's the nature of the claims as far as conventional quantum mechanics is concerned. And I think I, let me pause here. What's coming is details of the calculations that support those claims. Um, let me just give you some headlines. Um, how we describe the emergence of space time, how we describe the emergence of matter and particles, 
uh, more on this idea of variety, um, the idea of the real ensemble and how we compute with it, details of the recovery of quantum mechanics. On and on and on. So I have a lot of details to communicate, but I think I've communicated the main ideas. And so let me go to a summary and then talk about very briefly about ongoing work pushing this viewpoint ahead. So to summarize, the universe consists of views of the causal past of the present events. And you should watch out for me using words like past, present, and future, because I use them like a presentist, which means that I like presence. And that's, that's a bad joke, I'm sorry, but nobody laughed. Um, and- <laughs> We're muted though. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, so that's my picture of cosmology. The universe consists of views of the, their causal paths of present events. Systems with similar views interact. This replaces locality. That is, I didn't discuss the details, but if you're extremizing this variety and there are two events which have very similar views of their past, they try to add members to the ensemble which are different because you, you have a big negative potential energy if you start to pile up too many views which are similar. And so that's why I say that these interact through a potential that acts to increase the diversity of views, which is called the variety. Events are causally connected by transfers of energy and momentum. Space-time is emergent from these transfers of energy and momentum. And there's a little interesting bit there, if you like Nevis theorem, this seems to be kind of inverse or dual Nevis theorem, which is acting. Um, I mentioned that Bohm's quantum potential comes from this variety function and why we are not described quantum mechanically while our atoms are is because we are each wonderfully unique beings and we don't have copies in the universe so we're not describable as members of ensembles. So where is all this going? Um, well, there are, and this is almost my last slide. It's the next to the last slide. Um, because the work as I've described to you is mostly, was mostly finished and most of it was published by 2017. Um, since then, I've been with various people developing in different directions. Um, the idea that the fundamental laws are irreversible and is something that needs explication and there's work going on which develops that, um, some of it with Celia Verde. Um, if this is really a description of nature, then general relativity, which is time reversible, should be actually an approximation to a time irreversible modified gravity theory. So there's lots of papers and conferences and so forth by cosmologists who study modified gravity theory, where they take general relativity and they tinker with it a little bit. But very few of them study whether you can modify general relativity in a way that makes it time asymmetric. And it turns out there's several consistent ways to do that. So we've been studying that with Marina, with Andre Little, with um, Gomez. Um, these are all things I could talk about if people want. Um, we're very used to the idea in thermodynamics that time irreversible systems with dissipation and friction evolve out of time reversible systems. 
But is there the reverse? If I fundamentally have a time irreversible system, is there a way for time reversible systems to emerge? And can we learn something about the early universe from that? Um, and I think I'm gonna stop there. There are some, um, no, I have a, these few things to mention, just to advertise work that is soon coming out. Um, the idea of evolving laws and is turns out to be very tightly integrated into quantum foundations issues. You are in quantum foundations, and I think this started with Lucy and Hardy, but may go further back talk about generalized theories of probability and then having axioms and deriving quantum mechanics. Um, we can approach some of these issues about a generalization of quantum mechanics, which is time asymmetric um, through those methods. And there is work like that going on. And it loosely relates to an approach to evolution of laws that I call the principle of precedent. That is systems which are similar to systems in the past appear to obey similar laws. The conventional explanation is, well, there's laws of nature and they're out there and they tell the atoms and the molecules what to do. Um, a different proposal is that there are no such laws. There's nothing out there but a quantum system has the ability to sample the, its causal past and find out when there were similar systems and similar challenges to the evolution of systems in the past and act by precedent rather than by satisfying established un, unchangeable laws. And that's an idea that we're developing. Um, and one of the things that nicely comes out of that is that you can see why of all the different probabilistic evolution laws, unitary laws would be ones that you could get stuck in. That is, there are limit cycles and limit sets associated with the system discovering unitary dynamics. In general, um, and this is a paper with, with a number of different authors, but the lead author is Jaron Lanier, a computer scientist. We've been, and Will Cunningham, and there's, and there's four other people. And we've been developing a notion that we call autodidactic physics based on analogies to machine learning. We started out wanting, kind of wanting to debunk machine learning and ending up with a kind of understanding of the kind of dynamics that is modeled in machine learning as actually perfect for studying and modeling laws that evolve or what we now call laws that learn. So that's some of the things that are coming out soon under these concerns and I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. And I'm very happy to discuss any, any other things. Also. Um, may I ask, there is um, quite a few requests on the chat for the slides. People are interested to see the details that we didn't have time to cover. Would it be possible to circulate the slides? Of course. Yes, yes? okay, I will post them in the chat. Um, so, uh, yes. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say that uh, normally now we move to questions by the assigned commentator, who is Patrick Fraser. Uh, he asks a couple of questions to start the discussion, and then um, there is a free discussion for, um, of, with the audience, uh, as long as uh, you have time, Lee, given the oh, delay. Oh. <laughs> we'll see. I, you know, I got my supplies over there. I'm camped out. Um, I'm okay. very grateful for the interest. 
So um, let me also say that everything I mentioned is published except for some recent simplifications of the kinetic energy of the theory, which, which in the published papers is kind of, look, kind of looks handmade and messy. And I've cleaned up a great deal of that part of the derivation. And that's on the slides and it's coming in the papers now. But everything else is published. I will post in the chat also the links to the archives. We send them also through the mailing list. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the meantime, Patrick, maybe you can um, ask your questions. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so, hi, Lee. Thanks very much for this talk. Um, I found this, so this is a really interesting program that you're developing uh, for a lot of different reasons. And it seems like kind of the starting point for this whole project is to make sort of two basic assertions. First, that time is fundamental in a very in, in a not overwhelmingly strong sense, in insofar as it's the causal relations between events which is fundamental. Um, and once you've uh, assumed that much, that kind of allows you to start making use of, of sort of a bare causal set. Um, formalism. And then the other foundational claim that you also kind of make is that um, there's a lot more than just these sorts of causal relations and that um, actually the subtleties uh, between how different events get viewed also plays an important role. And that seems to be where you introduce this sort of relational uh, notion as well. Um, so I've got, a, I've got, well, I've got a lot of questions about this, but I'll try to keep it just to two so that other people can get involved with the discussion as well. Um, but when you, so you started, so, so you make two very interesting claims, namely that on the one hand, you're able to get an emergence of space-time structure out of this. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, that you still see non-local interactions. Yeah. Um, and this is a really interesting claim because Ordinarily, you think, well, if you have a, a classically emergent general relativistic spacetime, then the sort of non-locality you see in quantum mechanics will be very difficult to, to pull out. And so I just want to ask a question to sort of clarify that, which is kind of how do you, um, how do we justify introducing this variety of views into the dynamical equations that govern uh, the evolution of, of these kinds of causal systems. So like we see, you often hear, for instance, um, things like when you write down a path integral in, and you look at the uh, emergence of, of classicality out of a path integral, you see like certain terms which uh, they interfere with each other and cancel out and all that remain with large probabilities are classical terms. Um, and it seems like you're kind of doing something a little bit the opposite of that, where uh, increasingly distinct, uh, you, you see larger contributions to the dynamics by more distinct views. Um, and I was just wondering if you could clarify that a little bit more. Yeah, there are several questions, I think distinct questions. So let me show a bit of some of the steps between, and you tell me if this, if this isn't helping. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so first, uh, an energetic causal set as we developed it with Marina um, is a causal set. So those are events and causal relations indicated by the arrows in which there's also a structure in which given a pair of events, there's an energy momentum vector flowing from one to the other. For each event, there's a total energy momentum, which is the, the sum in minus the sum out. And this, of course, we require to be conserved. And in terms of the structure of the dynamics, these function as constraints which generate a quote motion in the dual space to the momentum space. 
which is conventional, except that usually the dual space isn't there or is there, and here the dual space isn't there. The little trick, so I have a number of constraints. Let me just skip that. Um, the little trick is, so there is the path integral as we write it down. And I notice it, it looks like a lot going on, but there's a DP, those are the momenta between the events transferred from one event to a later event. There are the delta which, which preserve the conservation law um, at each event for energy and momentum. There is the exponential of Q, which is the variety. And I'll come back to the details of that. Um, so that's the definition of the amplitudes. And we, after that, we're very conventional. Now, um, there's probably too much going on here, but so let me just use words. Um, the way that space time, so this path integral is what we imagine summing over to define quantum amplitudes in a conventional way. Um, there's no space or time here, but there is causal order and causal order is being summed over for different histories. Um, but I have a delta function constraint and I have to compute with that. And the standard way to compute with that is to invent a Lagrange multiplier, which lives in the dual space. In this case, the dual space to momentum and use that to exponentiate the constraint. So I have, so that constraint was called P momentum and I have a Lagrange multiplier Z which is multiplying it. And these Lagrange multipliers become the coordinates on the dual space, i.e. they become space-time coordinates. And the equations of motion, look at this, the picture in the lower right-hand side, be, become a, a, equations that basically hook up the momentum PKI transferred from event ZK to event ZI. And that satisfies an equation which relates the difference in those space time points to the momentum and whether this is time like or no. So one gets causal relations described in the dual space as part of the semi-classical description of the stationary phase points of that kind of path integral. And that's the flavor of how space-time emerges. Now, of course, there are many such legs in a complicated process. And the question you have to ask is, can you construct a flat space-time to leaving order from those equations? And that's either true or it's not true. If it's not true, then the space-time has to produce curvature and I have to go back and put in more structure to make curvatures appear. But that's the kind of meat and potatoes of, that's a simple of, of, of what happens calculationally. Does that, did that help? Yeah, so that makes sense kind of how we, how we see the standard relativistic picture come out of this. Um, and now I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that works in relation to this claim to non-locality because it seems like uh, the kind of non-locality that you get out of this arises because you introduce this, this sort of Bohmian potential as the potential given by the variety of, of different views. Um, and it just seems like that, I, I'm not entirely sure how that works in relation to uh, this foundational causal structure that you suppose from the beginning. I, I absolutely. And so there's a lot of detail about how something that you might call a, a trajectory of a particle emerges. So I'm gonna skip by that, but this would be necessarily part of it. Um, then I, I wanna show you a further step 
So you believe me, I have this variety function. Um, yeah, that, this is what I want to show you. Um, so this is the action as it's originally written down. And so the Zs into the constraints P, I, I'm just going to make some assertions and tell me if you need the details. Sure. Uh, those cash out into integrals along world lines of Z dot, which are the position of the world line into the momentum P. So that looks like the synthetic structure slowly emerging. The part of the variety related to comparing causally related of the paths of causally related events or the views of causally related events cashes out after a lot of little detailed calculations I can show you to P squared. And the variety among causally unrelated events cashes out to the Bohmian quantum potential. And I can argue with you, I can show you basically you confuse it and it comes out, but the, and that's where the non-locality all lives. But basically, if you do some dimensional analysis and you write down what that function has to turn out to be as an integral over the space of possible configurations of views and you count density measures and dimensions, it comes out to be the only thing it can be. It's very constrained. And it comes out to be, in particular, the integral over some probability density rho of del squared rho over square root of rho squared, if I remember right. So and these are, this is just the, the different steps and the different calculations. So if people will have the slides, um, it, it's hard to know how to, how to communicate these things. But after a long story, you get something of this form where it's an integral over the space of possible views of S is related, the gradient of S is related to the momentum and you have an S dot term, you have a gradient of S squared term and you have a potential energy term. So sort of layer by layer, it comes down to where your action principle is like that equation in the box at the top and that just happens to be the real and imagined. That's an action principle for the Schrodinger equation. When you express the quantum wave function as the square root of rho e to the is over h bar. Um, right. and, um, and as I said, there are higher order terms in one over n that, that come out. So all of that, is just a, a, a lot of conventional dyna stochastic dynamics and probability theory. Um, so I don't know, does that, that's, that's some of the... Yeah, I think that kind of clarifies how we're able to see on the one hand, a sort of classical space-time like structure. And also on the other hand, how we're able to start seeing these typical kind of Bohmian non-locality type uh, phenomena as well. Um, Cause that seems to be kind of where a lot of the, I guess the quantumness one might uh, colloquially say uh, in this theory comes about is, is through that quantum potential. So I just wanted to see kind of more explicitly how that, how that comes about. Um, if I've got time for just one, one more uh, kind of thing I'd like to, press you on with this. Um, in a slightly different direction, one of the purported payoffs of this theory is that it takes sort of the relational hypothesis very seriously, that different, um, that really what matters is the relations between observers and not so much uh, any sort of fundamental objective uh, quantities. Um, and there's a lot of lessons in contemporary physics that really point towards that being a useful thing to start looking at. 
Uh, in particular, when we look at quantum foundations, we see that there's a lot of discussion right now about these, um, these sort of multi-agent uh, uh, thought experiments and paradoxes that come up, like the Frau Kiger-Renner paradox and these extended Wigner's friend scenarios and all of this stuff. We saw the excellent talk, I think, last time by Richard Healy on, on this kind of thing. Um, and so what I want to press you on now is kind of where do we start to see um, persisting observers come about in this framework? Because one of the purported payoffs of a relational theory is that it would, in principle, allow one to have the kind of technology to resolve these sorts of multi-agent paradoxes. Um, and I understand what a view is in this uh, setting, but a view is really localized to a single event. Yeah. And so I'm wondering how we can see strings of views come together in a, in a sort of persistent way, such that they look like an actual observer. Well, look like an actual observer is a very interesting question. Um, would it be terrible if I introduce, so, I have some, for the last several months, I have a different work, which goes, which is motivated by the same thing, but is also very clearly addressed to your questions. So if I can introduce that, and this is work with Claudia Verde um, in Milano, and um, it's, it'll sound a little off, but let me just mention the key ideas and then we'll see what we're trying, where we're trying to go. Um, we, there's a big temptation, if you believe in the reality of time, to be a, something like a presentist, as I said. Um, but to be, as I learned from Avi most of all, to be a presentist quantum mechanically is really hard. It's really challenging because to start with of the delayed choice experiments, but there's much of quantum phenomenology, including some of the paradoxes you mentioned, or the three box paradox that make it hard to be a sort of flat out. What I would say a classical presentist is somebody who says, the events in the world are divided into the present events, the future events, and the past events, and it's an objective meaningful distinction, not a perspectival distinction. And the suggestion is that we can come closer to less tension with quantum mechanics if we begin with a different distinction, which is not past, present, future, but um, definite and indefinite. So basically what happens in the quantum world is that there are possibilities of things that could happen next and one does. And that is a transition from an indefinite to a definite. And we try to make that the ontology of a quantum world is the continual creation of definiteness. And where that connects to the quantum mechanical formalism is things that are indefinite get summed over that is you can superpose if they're to your causal past. And so part of the work of this is that you, you find you can reduce what you thought you was important about past, present, future to just this one distinction between definite and indefinite. And, um, and so that, I'm, I'm getting a little bit rambling because I've never discussed this in public, but um, basically things are definite if you want to sum over probability and things are indefinite if you want to sum over amplitude. And we make that kind of the primitives. Um, so, um, so that, that's all a long way around to ask about what the present is. And 
I have to answer what the present is to make sense of the questions that you're asking me about how do the non-locality relate to looking at, at causal structure, views of causal structure. I hope I didn't just confuse a lot of people. So it sounds kind um, of, sorry, uh, it sounds kind of like what you're suggesting is like, by having this well-defined notion of the present, then what you're able to do is, given a particular view at some event, um, you're able to see how the next part of this causal set is created and use this notion of the present to kind of connect the current view to a subsequent view. And then that gives you kind of a string of persistent observers. Is that kind of the, the trick? Well, in the work that we did with Marina, um, we had an algorithm which we had a notion of a present, which I'll tell you. So we, um, the, the causal set builds up by an, an algorithm which picks two elements of the present and makes them, and it picks the two which are the most different in terms of their past views and makes a new one, which is to the, whose parents are those two. So it's always looking to combine things which are diverse. Um, the notion of the present in that is very simple. Um, by such constructions, every event is limited to have a fixed number of parent events and a fixed number of prodigy or children. If you have had your fixed number, then you are no longer having any influence on the future and you're, a, you're in the past. And for us, the past is dead and serves no further function unless you can record from it records which you can use to make predictions about the, the future. Um, if you have had, if you have been created as an event, but you haven't yet had your maximum number of progeny, you are in the present because you have the possibility of being the progenitor of, an, of a novel event. So that's the, just, that's the meaning of the present that we use. And then we had definitely non-local dynamics to select over and over again, what would be the next events created. So that's how we addressed it in that. Um, but go on, I, I think I'm, I'm getting in the woods a little bit. Of it giving you all too much detail. Um, so, Lee, at this point, maybe we could uh, put down the slides. And uh, um, so feel free to uh, ask questions. Is there anybody in the audience that would like to ask uh, a question? I see somebody raising hand, I think. Yeah. Can I ask you, Lee, about the go deeper into the, the basic uh, premises of your view. When you are saying that laws evolve, I'm thinking about normal evolution. And then, you know, there, there can be evolution without some lawfulness. So you, you are actually invoking Darwinian evolution of the laws of nature. But for an organism to evolve, uh, there need to be some environment which is stable, which is already there and which has its own lawfulness there. Otherwise there would be no evolution. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how can laws of physics evolve without being some more basic lawfulness uh, which enable their evolution. And one more thing, when you say that uh, irreversibility evolves from reversible laws, aren't you again assuming some irreversibility because you're not saying that reversible laws uh, evolve from irreversible ones. So you are explaining irreversibility by assuming some irreversibility or am I making, uh, or am I making a mess of, of what 
uh, you were trying to say. No, that's beautiful. Um, let me take, can I take those one at a time? Of course. Right, so the first, actually, remind me in one sentence what the first issue is. I had something beautiful to say. Yeah, uh, we, we were talking about evolution. So in order for something okay. to evolve, okay. yeah. Um, so this is a question that we're dealing with in a paper, two papers actually, with Marina Cortez, Andrew Little, and Stu Kaufman, Stuart Kaufman. And we worry about how we can consider biological science Within, cosmolo within cosmology. And the, and I'll, I'll get to your question, but we find this is an important side issue that we have to have clarity about. Um, and this is really clarity of what kind of explanation suffices. And it's also about reductionism and limits on reductionism. Um, consider that we have the biosphere of the earth and it has at this stage a number of proteins which perform a number of functions in the biosphere and each of those proteins contributes something to the vitality or thriving of the species that makes them, that uses that protein, and therefore that protein exists. And we, we call that, um, oh, I, for, I actually forget, there's some special quote or clever quote of Kant that, that works there. But the key idea is that that the explanation for why that protein exists in nature, that is why you can find lots and lots of it, let's say hemoglobin, is that it performs a function which increases the survivability of some individuals of some species. Now, let's put this in context. Um, a protein is a chain of amino acids. And at each place in the chain, there can be 20 or so amino acids that might be there. And there are proteins in the hundreds and thousands of amino acids. So there's a vast configuration space, something like 20 to the thousand um, of possible proteins and only a very tiny portion of them are used in the biosphere. And here's where reductionism on the one side and functionalism meet. Um, if you want to explain why that protein is part of the biosphere and not in the jar of where, where most of them are, which are not part of the biosphere, you have to refer to its function. It's not enough to be able to integrate the Schrodinger equation, even if we could integrate the Schrodinger equation precisely enough to trace all the molecules zinging around. It wouldn't be illuminating, it wouldn't explain anything. So for biology to be a science, it has to be consistent with physics. That is the processes that make that protein have to be physically sensible processes but it has to have a functionalist explanation. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So now let's come to cosmology itself and let me notice something. Um, the space that we're working in, the space of possible proteins is not ergodic in the sense that it would take many, many orders of magnitudes of Hubble scales to explore in a way that would be called ergodic or, or equivariant, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Equal time and equal configurations 
Um, basically, in nature, you never have a situation where that ensemble is ergodic. So the functionalist explanation is always going to be part of the explanation for why those proteins exist. Now, why I've given all this long prelude is not just because I want to do biology sensibly, but when it comes to features of cosmology, of the laws of nature, we believe we're in the, the same, basically the same situation. That is, if we are asking why are these laws selected over some other laws, in the end, we're going to have to give a functionalist explanation for what this choice of laws does for some thriving of the universe as a whole. For example, in the cosmological natural selection for reproducing more. Are you with me? Yes, yes. I, um, still, you know, when, when an organism evolves, that means that the same conditions prevail over generations. Yes. Now you want universes to evolve, but then what are the conditions outside, outside of that universe? That, that would be your analog of the environment to which uh, this universe, evolving universe, must abide, must obey. Um, Good. So we divide thermodynamic systems into three types. Okay. In, thermodynamic systems in the cosmology into three types. Type one are systems where the equilibration time, the time to come to equilibrium, is very short compared to the Hubble time. And that's most ordinary systems that we used to apply in thermodynamics to. Then there are type two systems where the equilibration time are finite, and, but are longer than the Hubble time. And those are galaxies, um, bio, biological systems on a planet, um, stars, these are all out of equilibrium systems, which, which remain steadily out of equilibrium for time scales on the order of, or somewhat greater than the Hubble time, but they do eventually equilibrate. And then there's a third type of system, which as long as it has correct conditions, never equilibrates. And life, as we understand it, is an example of the third kind of system. And it requires to thrive systems of the second type of system. That is a star with a biosphere on a planet nearby that star. Is that helpful? Somewhat. I, will, uh, I don't want to take the time of other participants. So oh, I just... For the second question, when you say that irreversibility evolved from, from reversibility, you have reversible laws, but then the irreversible laws of our universe evolved from them. Aren't you then uh, assuming, implicitly assuming some more basic kind of irreversibility because you're talking about evolution, which is in itself gives you a direction of time. Well, in the... I, I think I, I either I didn't understand the second thing you said or I disagree with it. So what we believe we can construct is irreversible systems, systems that are fundamentally irreversible that have limit sets where they get trapped, which are irreversible but reversible on the subset and let me tell you what I mean by that if you have a discrete dynamical system then you have a bunch of states and you have you have an example of the system and given the present state its evolution to the next state is determined so it's on state one it goes to state two it goes to state three it goes to state four 
etc. That's what we mean by a discrete deterministic dynamical system. And if it's finite, then eventually, and eventually you can estimate how much, how much, how many steps this is as a function of n, and I don't remember. Eventually it will return to one of the steps in its cycle. So 1,496 step is the same thing as the 17th step. And then you've closed the cycle. And from then on, it's on that cycle. Now it's irreversible in the whole because there's a basin of attraction and there are many states that will descend down to this limit cycle. But if you don't know that and you truncate the system to just be the members of the limit cycle and you consider only prior states that come from the limit cycle, then you would make the mistake of thinking that the system is reversible. And that's what we claim is going on in many arguments. That is we, when people talk about the arrow of time in various physical systems, say electrodynamics, the electrodynamic arrow of time, there are retarded solutions, there are advanced solutions, and we have a puzzle because the Maxwell's equation allows both, but we only see one that is a retarded solution in nature. So our response to that is the actual equation only has the retarded solutions. That is the, the real solutions of the theory map down to only the retarded solutions. And the advanced solutions don't come from a solution of the full theory. But if you observe that theory, once everybody is in their limit set, you're not going to see those um, basins of attraction and you're, you're gonna make a mistake about the nature of your physics. And that we claim that we may be making that mistake when we study the problem of the arrow of time and we start by saying we have a puzzle because the laws of physics that is like Maxwell's equations and general relativity are reversible. So that's the kind of argument we wanna make or we do make. And then we, as I said, we go to lengths to find consistent modifications of general relativity, which have that property that they are one way their solutions only are retarded and they have no advanced solutions. And we can tell you, we know two different ways of consistently modifying the equations of general relativity. So they have that property. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Lee and uh, Avshalom. Is there anybody else I would like to ask uh, Lee? A question. There is a hand raised by Gislen. Please uh, unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Um, so I have a question on the causal sets. Um, okay. Are they made of a single connected components or can they be made of several fully disconnected graphs? Um, in particular, the ensembles from which quantum entanglement and the boom potential arise through the variety of a causally related events. Do they mix events from different connected components of the causal sets like parallel worlds or always within the one and same connected components? So it would mean that counterfactuals or alternative measurement outcomes that could have been do actually exist in the actual world just very, very far away outside of causal reach. I've never thought, I've never thought about that question. Thank you. Um, I would think that we have to have connected sets that will be vulnerable to various kinds of breakdowns if we allowed ourselves to have disconnect sets. But I've not thought that, thought that through. We certainly build the sets constructively. So in the work with Marina, 
she developed uh, lots and lots of numerical simulations and developed them. And they were certainly all developed so that they, they were single connected components. In the paper I mentioned with Jaron Manier and collaborators, um, we study several ways to grow sets and to grow networks and they're always connected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there uh, another question? Well, I see Renata. Yes, uh, hello, uh, Lee. Uh, I have a question which actually goes back to uh, 2012 when you gave a virtual talk in Vienna at the Emergent Quantum Mechanics Conference by uh, uh, Gerald Grösting. I don't know if you remember. Uh, oh. actually, you remember? Uh, you have presented the idea of some uh, fundamental causal units, uh, which inspired me very much to assumption about causal sets, which are basically six dimensional spatial units for physical systems. Uh, then we could have uh, particles and cells and the earth system, the solar system up to S3 in uh, S1 unit, which conforms to Newton's theorem, uh, would this meet your original concept of causal sets? I have to see the details. Okay, I maybe I can to... send it to you. Uh, what the... <laughs> yes? Um, we, we intend both to study the general theory as, as we described it, but there is also one paper where we show in detail that a spin foam model is yeah. an energetic causal set. And so we're interested both in general properties of those kinds of objects and specific examples. And your spin foam model, does it have a, um, a particular dimension? Um, Yes, I think it was three plus one. Um, there was also a two plus one dimensional model. I don't remember if we published it. This was work that started out as joint work with Wolfgang Valen. Yes. Then um, he, it ended up that there were two publications, and one in which we published simultaneously, which was his work and, uh, and our work. Um, but we certainly have in mind, um, we, we're not making any statement that the world is, is only made up of causal relations and energy and momentum. Um, we just think that those are the most important. And so we imagine generalizations where we put in other charges, conserved charges and where we add electromagnetic fields and very good. Okay. okay. But, uh, you still think you can build uh, uh, the unified theory from a spin form model uh, from a tiny unit cell of uh, space uh, which is um, making up the uh, causal structure of the universe? This would then be not background under independent as you sometimes refer to. Um, I'm going to say several things which are going to sound like they contradict each other. And they don't. Um, group quantum gravity and spin foam models can be coupled to matter. There's no reason they can't be and they have been from the beginning. So we can add chiral fermions, gay fields, scalar fields, and study their quantum dynamics. We know what the Hamiltonian constraint looks like. We know what the terms in the spin form path and the amplitude should look like. So there's nothing that prevents us from coupling to matter fields. Mm -hmm. so, um, there's nothing so far that restricts us to one choice of matter fields. Um, so there's nothing that is friendly to the idea of 
a unique unification. As we hope we can all listen to or other such things. Um, there are some ways to extend the theory to include gauge fields, which are particularly attractive aesthetically. Um, and we call those extended Kovansky fields. Um, and, but, and they're nice, they're kind of elegant the way they come together, but I don't think we have anything that's very convincing on that. Um, and then there's a set of works developed originally by Fotini with uh, yes. a PhD, uh, a, a postdoc from Australia, from Sundance, Gilson, Thompson, where we use gradings of the the, the edges of the skin networks to convey um, topological degrees of freedom that are chiral and that might be interpreted as chiral fingerings. And there was about 10 years ago, five or six or seven papers that developed that idea. And then it died the way that on the science dies, which is that we couldn't get the third generation to hook up right. We got the first two generations of Fermions. But that was a very concrete mm -hmm. model. And I, I still think that that's very much of interest. And, but um, it, there's no new, as far as I know, there's no new work about that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, well, let, let me just stop there and take another question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. <clears throat> uh, Alec Caburso has a uh, hand raised. Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Lee, for your interesting presentation again. I was uh, thinking about uh, the reversibility of events in your description of uh, basically a kind of uh, what I can describe as a cyclic computation. You also mentioned an algorithm in which you were evaluating the incoming uh, energy momentum, decide the events uh, and move on. And then there was the uh, point about the symmetric, uh, uh, the symmetricity of the lo some law of physics, like you mentioned electromagnetism and, and the other. Given this computation cycle, if we consider this basically Presentially, as a thick present in which we can have both the retarded wave and the backward evolving wave within this thick present, which is this elaboration cycle of events. And then at the next elaboration cycle, of course, what you have is what happened as a causal event. And what didn't happen is kept as a potential, basically. And then you repeat in each thick present. But in the thick present, you have the symmetricity of retarded and backward uh, wave, which results in the computation of the cycle that you're in which you are considering causality, and then you move on. So basically, a thick present is a symmetric picture inside the thick present that results at each cycle of computation in a causal progression with the irreversibility of events could merge this, this two per uh, perspective of uh, asymmetry in a thick present in which you see both ways of propagation and then a definite causal structure that at every cycle is computed. Can we consider this uh, possibility in your interpretation? Yes, very, very much. So um, it seems very difficult to avoid having a thick present um, from, from many different points of view. So I'm glad to hear that you're thinking about it. It's, um, it's confusing, but if you give a definition of the present like the one that I gave previously, there will be events inside the present which are causally related to each other. Um, it's also, um, if one considers the possibility of an, an energy dependence of the speed of light, um, as some people have experimentally thought about it, then the difference between where the experimental bounds are now is that if you launched a TeV, 20, say, or 30 TeV photon on a gamma ray burst at the same time that you launched a KeV photon going in the same direction, 
they arrive at a detector near the Earth after about a billion years of flight, about a second apart. So that's a, that's a scale of a kind of thickness of the present. Um, so um, I'm, there are many issues which I'm confused about. Um, obviously, if you have a thick present, um, it, it makes a number of things confusing and difficult. But if you try to have a, as a, a, a thin present, it, it, it's, doesn't, it's not clear. It's yeah, I think, yeah, I think present it's definitely impossible at the end to achieve, but with a thick one, you can uh, probably imagine. I was uh, talking about this because I'm coming from an engineering background and on computation, I'm also working on similar perspectives. So if uh, you are interested on in the thickness of this computational present, we can take it offline and probably. I'd, I'd love to talk about that. And let me just make the obvious point that for those of us who are foolish enough to think about neuroscience, um, then there is a thick presence certainly in the brain and the very disturbing for me data that I learn what I'm gonna do about a 10th of a second after people running a, a machine know is, is very thought provoking to me. I hope that result is just wrong. Yeah, it's, uh, it's crucial that you mentioned neuroscience, the idea of thickness. Basically, you said that time is the fundamental, but if we consider basically time as a memory, so as the ability of storing past information, we can consider this memory as, funda as fundamental. This memory is performing this cyclic computation and let the space emerge at its cycle. So we have a memory. We don't have a past, but we have a memory of it. As yeah. At the same time, space-time may be like a memory of what it is from which space emerged and in, it, in this cyclic thick present keep a track of the past as well, like uh, storing the information from which this, the current space can emerge. Yes, uh, something, like, something like that. Something like that. I'm, uh, it's fair. There are, I get very confused personally, but let, let's keep going. I love, uh, yeah, but my point, I agree that time is fundamental. We can picture it probably has a memory that is storing this uh, information that you describe as a causal uh, set information. And in this thick present, the elaboration happens and space emerge. So I, I think we are. Uh, heading in the same direction and probably it's worth discussing more on this computational aspect on, of the thick present offline. Thanks for your clarifications. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, so Lee, we are at two hours. Okay. How, um, this would be maybe a time to wrap up. I don't know if there is a question. I don't see any. Hands raised. As you, as you like. I'm happy. To okay. I'm happy. Is there? Ah, there are actually hands raised. So there let's, is. Uh, let's go a bit longer. Okay, uh, Jose Balduz. Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, I, I have a couple of things in mind. One, one is uh, about about you know what's real, and another one's about uh, quantum physics. You know, in the model, you seem to have presented, you know, that what's real, what's on a table as events. And then, so there's a set of events, and then some of those are linked. So there's causal links. And then there's a, there's a vector representation of the Lorentz group on each of those. Mm -hmm. And for every event, there is a view, which uh, maybe is the collection of all those past events that are linked to it or a subset of those, mm -hmm. a future view as well. Is that, is that, I mean, do you really need all those? You know, can you do away with the events? You say really it's the relations between the views that are important. I mean, what's your, what's your bottom line there? And, and my other thing is, you know, at, at, does at some point, you know, a quantum state emerge or a collection of quantum states? What do you think about that? Thank you. So thank you. So I, I don't have 
bottom lines about many of those kinds of questions. They're, the game is to make a model that does something interesting that we can learn from. And I'm, I'm very happy to play with models. Uh, that's to me where a lot of this comes from. That is, it, 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 um, Marina made, I don't know how many dozens or maybe even hundreds of different kinds of models of, in, in using various mixtures of these assumptions and we learn from them and then narrow down to something to present, but it doesn't mean we're not interested in, in something else. These are not meant to be laws. They're meant to be numerical experiments to study ideas, which is, it seems to me, a very good way to use a computer. Um, maybe, I, maybe I'll just, I'll just leave it. I'll leave it there. What, what I hope for, um, is principles, is to start off, is to have physics again organized so that there are principles. And we write down models to illustrate those principles and we study the models and we look for generic consequences. Um, the thing that I want us very much, and this seminar is an example of something new that younger people are doing to get us out of this ridiculous Bohmian versus many worlds, strings versus loops, people having affiliations to ideas in which everybody is sitting on top of a little hill in research space, um, protecting it from the advances of others. And to me, what's promising is to see people being open-minded and bringing what they understand. And we, we, we all develop things in different ways, but I hope we start to converge on what the principles are. Because to me, we, we have not been, the reason why we haven't made more progress with quote quantum gravity is because we've, we mistook making models for making theories and we miss the step of stating principles. And any, any chance of a quantum state emerging there somewhere? Or? Well, my picture for how a quantum state emerges is based on this idea of um, similar views so that there's there's no space, there's no penalty for being far away in space. So what I imagine is that if I have a little ion trap and I have an ion in it and it's in some quantum state, what is quote really happening is that there's a whole bunch of ion traps all over the universe or things that are isomorphic to it. And the, the state, since I don't believe that locality is fundamental, the state is being randomized amongst all these different realizations of the dynamics. And that's what the ensemble is. The state is you look at it with a laser and you could see, quote, this one or that one or that one or that one, because they're all connected to the world in the same way as regards to the laser. So they all get a probability to be probed by that laser. So I, it's this, the physical world that I imagine is very non-local at this scale, actively, actively non-local. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Lee, since um, um, we have some time yet, I would actually like to ask a couple of questions. Sure. Um, just to get a general understanding. Um, of, of the picture you have in mind. So I like a lot the idea that, um, you know, we're saying in loop quantum gravity and in many other things uh, that uh, space time is emergent. So, you know, when we talk about non locality, what do you mean by what is close to, to everybody else since you don't have the metric to begin with? Um, and I, I understand the intuitive idea of having somehow a bag of things where these things are. Um, 
are, let's say, the beeples and they are close to each other, if they're similar to each other, but not in the sense of being close to each other. Right. Um, now, where I have a bit of a hard time if imagining what's going on, I think that has to do with causality in there, is that, uh, so for instance, if I imagine two electrons that are being far away in the universe, um, and I just think of them as degrees of freedom, that you know, they, have, uh, they are electrons, so they are the same, um, but uh, they're not, uh, not electrons are going to be entangled, right? So they're not going to be close in the sense that you say, and they will interact because they are the same system. But, um, and that's what I'm missing. I, I don't know if you see what I mean, that yes, are you saying true. that causal past goes into that too, in whether they are similar or not? There they're similar or not in their causal paths. Mm -hmm. But what I think you're asking is, is a tricky question. Um, supposing I have a, a, an electron here and it's causal past, and I have an electron here and it's causal past, and this causal past is very similar to this causal past. We can discuss later how that's defined and measured and so forth. There are really two instances which once you have the emergence of position, so that it makes sense to say this one is here and this one is in Andromeda, um, they could be two electrons on a molecule which are just a few angstroms away from each other and therefore have similar paths. Or they could be two electrons this one on Earth and this one in Andromeda, and they are have the same. These two are very close because the overall geometry of space has emerged and controls what looks nearby at the semi-classical level of that path integral. But this, but because there are only a few degrees of freedom it can accidentally happen that there's one in Andromeda, which is similar to this, and one in the Crab Nebula, and so on. Um, and the theory doesn't know how to distinguish between those. Um, and you <laughs> might want to ask, how, are you really done? Have you really showed me that that is equivalent to quantum mechanics? That's the way I, when I run into a question like that, that's really the question. Um, because I throw those things together into an ensemble. And then I try to derive in a limit in which there are many members of the ensemble, an, an evolution equation for the probability distribution on the space of views. And I get what I'm looking for, but, um, and I'm not saying I'm, I, I'm making a mistake with the calculations, but did I really, there's some order where the, where the probability distribution sense that these are different situations, these two versus these two. And have I really dealt with that correctly as you go to higher order in the expansion? And that's a, to me, that's a technical question. And I don't know the answer. Did, did, did that, is that what you're worried about? Um, yeah, well, I think you went a bit uh, more in detail, but I, um, I, I'm not sure I understand what is the issue that is remaining. That would be interesting if you could uh, uh, clarify it. Well, so, so this has to do with the... It's an expansion uh, in what? It's an expansion. When I derive the Schrodinger equation, I make an expansion in powers of one over n where n is the number of systems in your ensemble that the probability distribution represents. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because everywhere in the expansion of that, the dynamics of that probability distribution is powers of n and one over n and one over square root of n and so forth. So that turns out to be the key parameter. Um, let me, can I back up 
and just raise a sure. question because it's something I've been, I don't ever see discussed. And I've been wondering about for many, many years. Um, if we believe that something like pilot wave theory or Steve Adler's theory of large matrices reproducing quantum mechanics, or any of these attempts to make a more realist description of what's happening in a quantum state. Um, we're physicists and we desperately want distinctions between a prediction of quantum mechanics and the prediction of one of these alternatives to quantum mechanics. That's gold, that's what we really need. So we need to be able to, to say what is the parameter which distinguishes your theory from quantum mechanics? That is such that in the limit that that parameter goes to infinity or zero, they become indistinguishable. And when it's finite, they are distinguishable at some order. And that, of course, is the first step in thinking about how you would build an experiment to distinguish them. So I always want to know since I don't believe in quantum mechanics and I believe it's um, approximation to some deeper theory where the boundary is. And in these kinds of theories I've been studying, the boundary is, a, is a order one over square root of n, where n is the number of systems that go into an ensemble before it can be said to imitate a, a quantum ensemble. Um, I see. Yes, I I, I notice that you have um, um, a, the possibility of an experimental test. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I don't, I'm not sure if I'm getting it right. Though the, the point would be that if uh, uh, so, if the if you do so complicated dynamics that somehow you cannot expect within the lifetime of the universe to have had such evolutions happening randomly or naturally, then you would expect that system to behave classically. Is that? Uh... Classically, I mean, not quantum mechanically even, but classical, classically. Yeah. I think so if it, if it would behave quantum mechanically, then it would be wrong. So this is a falsifiable approach it would be nice to i haven't managed i haven't made an experiment uh, an experimental context that works like that but I, I it would be nice um let me let me well i, I let me take let's have more questions i have more to say about that but it's getting again to be very specialized Okay, sure. Um, we have, I don't know if somebody else has a question. There is uh, yeah. this link. Can I ask a question? Please. Who, who is that? Uh, uh, Oded. My name is Oded. Uh, I, I would like to ask, uh, I have a, a, a very difficult time uh, uh, differentiating between your, uh, your uh, theory and uh, Julian Barbour's uh, theory. Okay. So, 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 uh, so, uh, you say you have a, 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 the the actual thing is that you you are saying that uh, time is fundamental, right? And uh, uh, and uh, um, Julian Barbour says that the time is uh, not fundamental, and and he actually jumps from event to event. Mm -hmm. Okay, how yeah. how how can you explain? Because the only difference between your 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 uh, your, your uh, explanations are that you have a law that uh, that uh, creates a new event, and he has a law that uh, that jumps from a pre-existing event to a, to a new event to 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 a, to a pre to a to a different event, which is also pre-existent. How can you, how can you establish that that your your uh, your uh, 
your view is is more is more is more uh, correct i don't uh, because it's confusing for me when i when i look at your papers it's it's very it's very Thank you for the question. I will have to mute you because we're listening to the music in the background. Ah, sorry, okay. sorry, sorry. And let anyway, I, I'm happy to answer. It's a great compliment to me. Um, Julian is, was certainly my mentor philosophically, and we're dear friends. Um, there are Julian, if I understand which part of his work you're referring to, does it believes that there is a configuration space? The quantum mechanics is defined by a probability distribution over configuration space. There is no causality. <coughs> there is, there are probabilities for a given configuration space to evolve to another configuration space coded into the wave function. And that's all there is for Julian and everything else is derived secondarily out of that. And certainly my assumptions are different, um, but it's a, it's a very good question. Um, are they, could you map in some sense the two views on each other? So that's, I don't know the answer, but- that, can, that, can, you, can you map it? Can, can you say that it is, if if we if we don't use a configuration space like Julian, we can say that okay, ev all events are right there, and 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 uh, and then we are just jumping from event to event. Well, Julian would say that there is that a moment is a frozen moment is a configuration frozen in quote time. And we evolve, the world just jumps randomly from moment to moment. And that's, we're talking about Julian. Excuse me. No, I mean, can you, I'll call him back to call back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the argument you're making, or I think the argument you're making is given Julian's theory, why do you need something which has more structure? Because what we're proposing has more structure in the sense that there is not just jumping according to the probabilities of a wave function, between um, moment and moment and moment and moment. But we have some forward dynamics in time, which is driven by some specified dynamics in the configuration space or on the configuration space. And I, again, I think that's a question of detail. I don't have an answer right away. I'm, I'm just suggesting that maybe there is a combination, taking only Julian point of view that events are always there and taking your point of view that, uh, that uh, uh, you have a law of jumping between events. Yeah, I, 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 that's not exactly the way I would put it because for me an event is just a small part of a configuration and the world has at one time many events or in one thick present many events. But can, can you get in touch with me? And that's, uh, I can see how that discussion might evolve, but I'm not being very good at, at addressing it right now. I would be happy to, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. More questions? Um, okay, if there aren't any more questions, we're at two and a half hours. Um, last Thank chance. You. <laughs>
I actually do, but I wanted to wait if to, so that anybody else has a chance as well. So oh, Gislen, right? He said in the chat, um, Lee, should we sure. go on for another five minutes? Yeah. Sure. Um, so, like you, I also believe that quantum mechanics is incomplete uh, and that it can ex be extended. I'm also a realist. Um, I'm following a different uh, approach uh, via decision theory and game theory. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever you want to, um, to try to extend quantum theory or, or complete it, of course, you need to consider impossibility theorems um, to, to, to check the boxes for them. Um, and if you look at impossibility theorems like Korenschwecker uh, uh, or Koren uh, and Comway, uh, um, uh, more recently, uh, Renner and Kolbeck on the quantum theory being maximally informative, mm -hmm. an assumption is recurring and, and that's free choice. Um, concretely, free choice is the fact that there is an independence of the choice of measurement axis uh, by the physicist from the past. For example, in statistical terms, if you use, uh, I think the approach of uh, Renner and Kolbeck is to have uh, random variables located in space time. I also saw a discussion on free choice between uh, Carlo Rovelli and you uh, uh, on the internet, but it was a slightly different uh, 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 um, discussion of free choice. My personal belief is that free choice is an approximation of some deeper physical phenomenon and th that we can drop it in some way. Where do you stand uh, with this? Uh, uh, if you consider the independence of the choice of measurement axis, where do you stand with the, the theory, uh, uh, with, the, with the views? So thank you for that. Um, there's, I, so I'm gonna go in a different direction because I, I don't have a clean answer for your question. Um, one of the things I, well, is it, it's appropriate if this is the last question because it's I'm going to be even further from the consensus than, uh, than I've been so far. Um, for me, this is part of a set of questions about what a human brain is or an animal brain. I'm not, I don't care about that distinction, but what a brain is and how a brain gives rise to a mind. And I've been trying to develop a view, and there's one paper on this on the Philosophical Archive, in which is kind of pan-psychic, but selectively pan-psychic. That is, I want there to be events that are contributions to consciously experienced parts of the world, that qualia are real, and I'm a realist about qualia. They have to be explained. And my view is that the panpsychist hypothesis, that all states of all kinds of matter are in some sense have associated with them a conscious aspect, which however does not impede on the determinism of the physical law. So it's a very wimpy sort of panpsychism to me, the usual panpsychism, because the real confrontation of the problem of qualia is what if they're causative? What if my fact of having experiences does cause me to perceive something, which it would seem to, it would seem that that's what they're about and therefore be part of the cause of why I made the choice. Um, so I look to restrict the panpsychist application that is the identification with qualia and choice to not all events, but very special events. And my definition of events that are special enough to be treated this way are that they're unique. And that is in the same sense and using the same metric that earlier in the conversation, I talked about the question about whether an event is unique or not, that is, has a unique view. Um, I give a connection to qualia and choice to those states which are unique 
so that the uh, the conscious experience is related to the system having to invent what it's going to do because it has no precedent in the history to rely on. So, and I, this is, I understand this is very presumptuous and this is way outside my, um, the world, what I was trained for, but um, I try to think that these very special events um, are that you can construct systems to be friendly to them. And that in some sense, what a living being is, is a system which is constructed so that it is hospitable to these kinds of events and has many of these events. And at least we have the possibility of experiencing genuinely novel thoughts, perceptions, ideas, because there are such things in nature. And now I've probably turned off all of the audience I didn't turn off before, but that's how, that's how I try to address these questions. And the only thing I published on them is this one essay, which is in the philosophy archive. Thank you, Lee. Mm, I think Renate had uh, one you. last comment. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, my question was rather to this uh, time topic before what you had before. Uh, I was thinking about uh, 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 the solution of this uh, problem with uh, general relativity. If you take um, uh, Silverstein's equation and uh, the old Hamiltonian uh, from uh, idea of time, uh, can in the, in the fourth dimension, will, will this solve the problem? What is Silverstein's equation? Silverstein and Conway, I think it was uh, 1912 or so. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with it. Can you send okay. it to me? Oh, yes, please. I will do it. Yeah, so I, I can comment. Because this could be a quaternionian uh, expression and that um, um, makes it more simple, I think. But I will send it. I like quaternions. I like quaternions mm -hmm. better, but I'm not familiar with that paper. Okay. I will send it to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I think this is the moment to wrap up, maybe. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Lee, for your, your time. Thank you. It has been very, very interesting. And um, I hope to see you also um, soon in our next seminars. I, I absolutely, and thank you very much. And thank you for running these seminars. It's, they're, they're really very important. Thank you for saying that. Um, I will, uh, so it might delay a bit to go on YouTube because I will have to take the, um, the beginning and uh, make one video. Um, but as soon as it's up, I will also uh, let you know. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And best, best um, to everybody. Great, bye. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye.